Um, hi. Uh, I'll wait for the last photos to be taken, you know. Uh, my name's uh, Chris DeBona. I work here at Google, uh, and I want to welcome you here. We're really very pleased to have all of you here. It's quite an honor to have such a great group uh, come and visit us. Uh, when Ramesh asked if, you know, could we just you know, use the cafeteria or something and, and have a nice meeting, you know, I immediately said yes. And then I asked my boss, and he's like, sure, uh, yes. Who are they? You know, and, and so uh, we were all very, very happy to, to have you here. So thank you for coming. Uh, and thank you for coming to, to America, too, from, from so far away. Uh, I had the – so uh, Heather mentioned that I should explain what I do for a living, I guess. Um, <laughs> so I have sort of an unusual job here at Google. I look after uh, open source software uh, for the company. And that's kind of a weird thing to say because uh, how do you look after something that is inherently unlook afterable? Um, and so my job is to ensure that open source software in general remains a healthy – sort of resource for us to draw upon. So uh, we run a number of programs along those lines, including the Summer of Code, which is a global program in 93 countries uh, that pays people to work on open source software through the summer, and uh, as well as the Google Code In, which is for people 13 to 18. Uh, both these uh, programs have been pretty successful. We've introduced about 7,000 developers to open source software this way, and, and, and it's paid so, uh, so that people can actually do this as a kind of job. Uh, while they're learning, so uh, it's been it's been great. It's it, I believe it's injected a lot of life into open source. Uh, one of the things we noticed a couple of years into it, and actually I had already noticed as a professional in the field, was a lack of women uh, in open source software development. Uh, I, I don't need to share with you how rare it is to see women, uh, not just from the regions you're from, but just any woman in open source software. Um, it's traditionally about uh, a third or a fifth as small as it, as women are represented in normal computer science, which in this country is actually not not fantastic. Um, so we, we made some concerted efforts around uh, funding specifically uh, groups that were targeting women in open source as well as in computer science as well. Uh, Google does this as well with the Anita Borg scholarships and a variety of other programs. Uh, so this was so when Ramesh asked, I'm like, well, yeah, of course we'll host them. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, my personal experience in the region is kind of is kind of weird. Uh, I actually never made it to the Middle East until uh, late last year uh, when I was asked to speak at a conference in 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 Qatar, and and that was really interesting because I had never been to the region. And uh, as an American, you're told a lot of things about the Middle East, right? And actually visiting and seeing it with your own eyes was uh, extremely enlightening. Uh, and that was made even more so when I visited Jordan and Egypt uh, early this year uh, during our developer days. Uh, and, and, and specifically in Muslim-dominated countries, it was very, very interesting to visit Malaysia uh, because it was the first time I spoke before an audience which was, which was majority woman. Uh, speaking in open source software means you're speaking to a lot of men uh, more often than not. And so to be in a room that was, it was about 60% woman was shocking to me. I mean, I had never seen it before. And, and I remember I, I spoke with one of the women who attended, and I was like, you know, i got to ask you. I've never seen this before. How is it possible that, that in Malaysia, a place which I considered uh, somewhat conservative in their approach to women's rights, uh, how is it possible that this is 60-plus percent women? And she's like, oh, if we don't have a good career, we're just – we're in trouble. Um, you know, uh, if we don't find a really good career, we're, we're not valued at all. So we have a very hard time making a living. We have a hard time making do by ourselves. Uh, so we would have to get married. We would have to have children. And we'd have to do it very, very quickly. Or we have to become very valuable to society. And the route for a, a lot of Malaysian women turned out to be computer science. And that resonated with me because I, I honestly feel that computer science saved me personally from going to jail, from what, you know, <laughs> and, and whatever direction I was heading in. I really lucked into my career because I loved computers and programming them so much. Uh, and so I guess that's why I'm here today. Don't go to jail. Become computer scientists. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't want to take up a lot of time. You're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to these really nice people. Uh, I'm assuming they're nice, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> they are. They are nice. Um, so, so the long and short of it is, please enjoy your stay here at Google. We're really, we're really pleased to have you here. And I'd like to introduce uh, Trish Tierney, uh, the executive director for the West Coast IIE. Trish. So.
Thanks, Chris. And thanks to you and all your colleagues at Google for hosting us tonight in this uh, fabulous room with this great view. I live in San Francisco, and I've never gotten to have an event or go to an event that had a view like this. So it's a treat for me and I'm sure for all of our guests. On behalf of the Institute of International Education, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight. And um, I'd just like to take a moment to tell you a little bit about IIE, and then we'll get to the most exciting part, which is the tech women themselves. IIE is one of the world's largest educational organizations, and IIE was founded over 90 years ago in the aftermath of World War I, based on the idea that we could only have lasting peace in the world if there was better understanding across nations and amongst individuals. As technology opens borders, education and professional exchange opens minds. And I think that Tech Women as a program really gets to the heart of that. Tech Women is funded by the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs. It's managed by IIE and implemented in partnership with Anita Borg Institute for Women in Technology. The program was developed in response to a speech that President Obama delivered almost exactly two years ago in Cairo. In that speech, he called for greater collaboration between the US and communities that have predominantly Muslim populations. Uh, about a year later, at the White House Summit on Entrepreneurship, Secretary Hillary Clinton announced Tech Women, and almost immediately there was a lot of excitement about this program. Once we launched the program, we received over 300 applications for 37 spots. And I'm happy to say that we have the best and the brightest of those 300 people here with us tonight, the 37 women who were selected to be the inaugural class of Tech Women. And I, and I say inaugural class because I really hope that the program continues and grows and includes many more women in the years to come. But this group here is special because they're the founding members. And we will always remember them. And they will also help us to spread the word and to make the program successful for future generations of women. Who are these women? They range in age from 24 to 41. They have a range of 2 to 15 years of experience in their technical fields. 19 of them have master's degrees, and 6 of them have PhDs. All of them are impressive, courageous women who left their homes to come here for five weeks. They're emerging leaders in their fields and in their communities back home. They'll be here in the US for five weeks. Four of those will be here in the Bay Area. And they're all hosted at leading tech companies in Silicon Valley and, and San Francisco. They're paired with both technical and cultural mentors. The mentors help them design and implement professional projects related to their fields and also give them advice on how to adjust to being here. Many of them have never been to the United States before. And some of the advice includes where to go grocery shopping, where is the AT&T store, uh, they go hiking, they go to Giants games. Some of them were telling me tonight that they visited Juvenile Hall and met with girls that are incarcerated here. And I thought that was really a wonderful example of the fact that they're here not just to learn more in their technical fields, but they're here to learn about us as Americans, about the Bay Area, and all that entails. And one of the things that make exchange programs so powerful are those real people that you meet. And I think all of us can remember going on trips to other countries. And you remember the museums and the synagogues and the churches and the mosques that you visit. But the things you remember most are the people that you meet. And so I hope that all of you take time to talk with the women and make them feel welcome. And I know that you, you're already doing that. So um, I also just want to say that the host companies, uh, the technical and cultural mentors, I want to take a moment to thank them. Because without you, without your companies and your time and energy, this program could not happen. So thank you to all the mentors. Um, and then after four weeks here, they'll uh, during their four weeks here, they're also attending networking workshops on entrepreneurship. They're going to tech talks at leading companies. They attended a leadership training. 
And then after four weeks, they'll travel to Washington, D.C. for the 4th of July. And while they're there, they'll meet with leaders at the State Department and other government officials. And then perhaps most importantly, they'll watch the fireworks from the State Department balcony. And many of their mentors will go with them. And then hopefully they'll get to have lunch with Secretary Clinton. Uh, one of the best parts of the program, I think, is that it's a two-way exchange. So a lot of times the exchange is only one way people come here. But in this case, uh, many of the American-based mentors will travel to the region. So in the fall, a lot of mentors will go to Lebanon and Morocco. And on that trip, they'll conduct further workshops so that we can reach more women in the technical fields. And also, uh, interestingly, they'll reach out and have workshops with young girls to excite the next generation of women leaders to pursue technical careers. I hope that is an, enough information to sort of set the scene and give you a little bit of insight into the program. Tonight we'll hear from four of the women who are here uh, on the Tech Women program. And I thank all of you for making them feel welcome. Before I turn it over to our moderator, I'd also like to mention that we have two additional State Department delegations here with us tonight through a program called the International Visitors Leadership Program. We have 13 women that are economic leaders representing 10 countries in the Middle East and North Africa, and five visitors from Jordan focused on technology, science, and innovation. So it's wonderful to have them here as well. And it's great to look out and see just the incredible diversity and experience we have in the room with us tonight. With that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight's panel, Ed Bice. Ed is the chairman and founding CEO of Midan, which is the world's first cross-language social networking and social media platform. Ed has published in national press, including the New York Times, New Republic and Mother Jones, and has been interviewed on national and international radio programs. He's a regular speaker at international conferences, and we at IIE are lucky to count Ed as a partner as we're working with Midan on another program we run with the State Department called Immediat, Electronic Media, Tools, Technology, and Training. The program builds the capacity of grassroots organizations to use digital technology to tell their stories better, to reach out to members of their own community and also connect with people around the world. And Midan has been a valuable partner to us in that program and we're thrilled to have Ed here with us tonight. Uh, thanks very much, Trish. Um, so uh, I'm really pleased to be moderating this panel tonight. Um, first, uh, and, and thanks to Trish and Heather and the, the whole IIE team for, for putting this event together and for inviting me to, to, um, uh, to be the moderator. Um, and uh, I've already made some very good friends tonight and, and looking forward to the conversation. So um, my job tonight, my goal is, is to uh, facilitate a conversation between the audience and, and these four brilliant women up here. Uh, so we have 45 minutes or maybe an hour. Um, there's uh, you know, 10 years worth of knowledge here that we, we, you know, we, we, could, we could share, but um, uh, so we'll, we'll have to keep it to the point. Uh, I will do some intros uh, initially. And then we have a set of questions, and I'll, I'll ask uh, one or two, or in some cases, three of the panelists to respond to the questions. And we'd like to encourage anyone in the audience to chime in at any time, asking for uh, uh, clarification, offering your questions. We'll also hope that we have some time uh, at the end to, to uh, take questions, general questions from the audience. So um, with that, I'll, I'll move into the introductions um, and, uh, and uh, looking forward to the, to the evening's discussion. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start uh, with uh, Saida Bomidi, who's a senior project man manager at uh, MobiNet Morocco um, and is doing her internship 
with uh, the MPay Connect company, mobile payment company, doing uh, fantastic and interesting and socially relevant work. Um, and uh, I'll try to balance my papers here and <laughs> and provide a bit more background. Um, so Saida uh, has um, an MBA um, from ENPC Paris, uh, and uh, is is I'll correct myself. She's project director at Moby Net S. So that's that's correct, and uh, is is additionally uh, involved in um, many Moroccan social and professional associations. Um, Reem El Mograbi. Uh, has lived almost everywhere, from what I can ascertain. Uh, it, it, Reem is a 24-year-old Palestinian currently living in Cairo, although has recently spent three months in Tripoli, and we'll talk about that experience with us. Um, she's been working as a software engineer at ValleySoft for three years and uh, has a, a bachelor's degree in computer science from AUC, um, with a double minor in mathematics and philosophy. And I promised Reem that I wouldn't ask her any questions about philosophy, <laughs> although we are going to have a long conversation about that later. Um, uh, so uh, next, Raya Abugosh. Uh, and uh, Raya is, uh, I'm not sure how you managed this, but sh her, her, her regular job is with Yahoo Middle East and somehow she got an internship with Yahoo here. So um, not sure if that really counts, but um, so she, she uh, her position with Yahoo Middle East is, is uh, as a quality engineering manager. And uh, she uh, was instrumental in uh, its acquisition of Maktoub, uh, one of the most significant events in the uh, Middle East tech landscape uh, it happened two years ago, I believe. 2009, end of 2009. End of 2009, and uh, represented. Uh, it, it was it was a uh, watershed moment for a company that had was was started in Jordan, uh, built up a, a a team of incredible engineers, and then and then uh, was was acquired a major acquisition from from Yahoo. So pleased to have Raya here and. Last, and certainly not least, uh, Gada Bahig um, is an engineering manager at Mentor Graphics in Egypt, uh, and got a, uh, earned her bachelor's and master's degrees uh, with honors in computer science from, from AUC also, American University in Cairo, um, and is currently pursuing her PhD. So, um, uh, I will start by asking the panelists to make introductory remarks, and then we'll move into the, the Q&A. So, Saida? My name is Saida, as uh, Ed said. So, Saida in Arabic means uh, happy. So, I'm so Saida to be with you today. <laughs> Um, I'm Moroccan. I live in uh, in Casablanca. So I'm an engineer with uh, 11 years of uh, I mean of telecommunication and electronic experience. Uh, my background is uh, mainly related to the uh, mobile added uh, value services, and the way I have MBA. Okay, and um, I mean. Uh, I'm also an active member in a mini association, but I want just to say one word. I'm vice president of association called Div Network, just to set up the equality between men and women in professional environment. And also I'm the vice president of other association called I Love Morocco Sport and Culture. <laughs> so I'm organizing mini, mini hiking there. So all of you are invited to join me in Morocco and to discover my own for I mean, uh, country. Uh, I wanted to say a uh, small, I mean, uh, uh, some word about uh, being in the uh, Take Women program. So this program uh, helped me a lot 
to have a clear vi I mean, vision for the first uh, I mean, time of my life and also to shape my goals. So now I wanted to come uh, back to my country and to run my uh, own business, especially as a consultancy, uh, to give I me mean, to help customers like uh, Google <laughs> to uh, start uh, their business in mobile banking, mobile payment. And also uh, I would like to be uh, as a tech woman representative in, representative in my country just to duplicate this experience and uh, translate all what I get in as tools here uh, in Morocco. Thank you. Uh, hi, this is uh, Reem. Um, actually, I would start by saying that it's a miracle that I'm here. Um, I mean, uh, it's really hard to have been in the Middle East during the past uh, few months and attending actually more than one revolution. So applying to the Tech Women program was uh, eventually a, a sort of, uh, you know, an experience from applying from a lot of countries and, uh, you know, I think it's luckily, or you might think that uh, whenever I go, there is a revolution that starts, but <laughs> um, I was in Egypt when I started applying for the program. And then during the uh, revolution, actually, the, f the day the deadline was for applying to tech women, the internet was gone <laughs> for three days. So, um, but luckily enough, we got to actually continue the application afterwards. A um, uh, little background about where I come from. I'm a Palestinian refugee and I live in Egypt and I grew up in Libya. So uh, basically I have like residency in both countries and uh, that's why I had to go to Libya after the Egyptian revolution to, to, to apply for, for my residency there. And uh, although the revolution was already like ongoing in, each, in, uh, in Libya, uh, I went there and on the same day that I, well, I reached there, uh, the, the no-fly zone was applied. So um, a lot of drama and uh, my application uh, continued. I left Libya, I left Egypt, sorry, uh, with the uh, uh, procedure for getting the interview done, uh, processed. So I did my interview in Libya and I completed all the application over the phone with my sister who was in Egypt <laughs> because there was no internet and until now actually there's no internet in Libya. Um, then to go back to Egypt, I had to go to Tunis <laughs> to complete, you know, the, the revolution uh, cities. <laughs> yeah, some people tell me you have to go Ye to Yemen and Syria, you know, afterwards. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, the, I mean, probably um, uh, different experiences in so many countries and different stages. Egypt, I intend in the whole revolution, I, I think, uh, Libya, ongoing revolution, and uh, Tunis, you know, after revolution. Uh, I think uh, the Tech Woman program, uh, or sorry, I mean, I'm speaking first about the technology. Uh, I feel like the, the, those revolutions was... Um, the best example of how the uh, uh, technology is impacting in the Middle East. All those revolutions were started by the people's social uh, communication online uh, through social uh, media, uh, the, the YouTube uh, videos uh, sharing what, uh, if, uh, what, uh, what each one sh had of uh, an experience in the Middle East uh, with the uh, regimes back then. Uh, so I think that technology impact was uh, a great thing during the revolutions. Um, I want uh, to make a wish for all of us, the mentees who are here, who are luckily enough, uh, we're lucky to be part of this program, that actually when we will go back, we need to share this uh, experience and contribute to build a freedom, uh, a freedom country, f countries full of freedom and independence. And uh, I think it's the best time now to go back with this experience that we had here and to share it with all our families and people in the Middle East. Thank you, Reem. Uh, my name is Raya. I come from Jordan, um, from Yahoo Maktoub. Uh, funnily enough, if you say that that counts or not, uh, when I applied to the Tech Women program, it's a five-week program which requires a long uh, leave of absence. And I was afraid that I will not get that leave of absence, and I was really <laughs> willing to quit my job for that. <laughs> but <laughs> luckily enough, I got all the support I needed from my management and from uh, Yahoo here. It worked out perfectly because I'm being trained um, uh, deep 
um, within my field, the quality engineering field, and also um, I'm being trained by people who are part of the women in tech uh, community. So it, it fits perfectly into what I'm um, willing to achieve from this pro program. So I hope it counts. <laughs> um, uh, to my background, I studied computer science. Um, I studied computer science not out of passion. Um, it was kind of a, a drawback because I really wanted to go into architecture. I love art and I love uh, math and uh, geometry and stuff like that. And although I had good breaks all through the high school years, in the, the definite year, the 12th year, the Tawzihi year, which kind of in our region defines your future, I didn't do so well. And I didn't get good enough grades, so I had to go to computer science. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I didn't like that at all. And this is one of the moments when I say, thank God for that. <laughs> so I studied computer science. I went into the, um, I started as a developer. I went into the quality engineering team. It was a very new field in my region. Back then, it was not very well known. We called it quality assurance. And uh, I was lucky enough to um, climb the ladder and um, up to a management level, middle management level. Uh, uh, I created the, the QA team in, in, back in Mektub uh, in 2006. Uh, I was hired to, to create a team, and that itself was an amazing uh, experience creating something from scratch. And now um, I, I, can, I would like to continue our point that Mektub was a huge success story, and it is a breakthrough in the region. Uh, after the Mektub, Yahoo Mektub acquisition, not only is it that brand representative of the Yahoo global brand and the Mektub word, which is an Arabic word um, that is now being well known in, uh, uh, in the world, uh, it also opened up the doors for investors to come to the region and take us, the, 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 the Arab and the regional brains seriously. And the, the, the last year was really great. A lot of entrepreneurship and all of com competitions and new businesses and new incubator, incubators. And uh, it was a very exciting year from the region. I know many people who just quit their jobs and started their own businesses. <laughs> I don't know how far they will get, but it's, it's good. It's a good experience. Change is good. Um, we're now willing to take more risks. And uh, from this program, I'm hoping to take more risks, be more confident um, from the very first workshop, we, we, we got really a huge um, boost of confidence. I think all of us did. Uh, so in the future, I'm hoping to get uh, out of this program to create my very near uh, future job within Yahoo and in the very um, further uh, future to create more jobs in the region. Thank you. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> this is something we learned at the innovation workshop uh, that Barbara taught us to always say fabulous, amazing, awesome, great idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I'll tell you after the, word, the talk today. So, um, um, so just a reminder, my name is Gada. I'm an engineering manager at Mentor Graphics. And not only that, I'm a parent of a nine-year-old daughter and I'm a single mom. So it, it has been quite challenging to sort of balance them out. But I'll just go back a bit and tell you how I went into the technical field because I thought I think that's an interesting story. Uh, so during my school years, I, I was a, like a good student. Um, I performed well. I got good grades. But I always, uh, my hobby was to read. I, I enjoyed reading. So um, and and I'm fortunate to come from a family that is uh, well educated and uh, career disciplined and oriented. So. Um, uh, so I joined. Uh, I, I joined the American University in Cairo, and the first thing I thought about to mo and to told my parents is, uh, I want to major in English literature. And uh, my folks told me, okay, this is a hobby. You can keep doing it, but you know what? You need to go for something that can guarantee you a career. So I had a good GPA, and I basically started thinking, okay, what is the department that gets the highest GPA in the science field? Oh, computer science. Okay, I'll join that. And I had no idea what that is and didn't have a passion for it or anything. So I, I, I went through my years of study. I graduated with honors. And uh, 
Um, after we all graduated our class, there weren't a lot of job opportunities in the software engineering industry in Cairo. So um, a lot of us ended up working as business analysts or uh, consultants, or some even mastered in uh, like took another master's degree in political science and switched careers, or they traveled to the States and worked in engineering firms there. But I was fortunate to work in an engineering, one of the very few engineering firms in Cairo. And uh, I worked there for six months and then I hated it. I, I couldn't take it. It was basically we did not do anything except programming. There was no human interaction. So I, um, I, start, I decided to quit and I joined uh, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers as a, as a consultant. But then um, I had the chance to uh, travel to Canada and I worked with Nortel Networks as a software engineer. And that's the point where I started being a technical woman. I enjoyed every single thing in software engineering, analysis, design, discussions, brainstorming, programming, coding, making a difference, feeling a sense of achievement. I've been through that all and I loved it all. And, um, and, uh, and um, well, the legacy continues. I told you when I was at school, my, uh, I always thought I wanted to be like a professor. I, I enjoyed reading. Uh, my daughter was uh, telling me when she was six years old that she wanted to be a professor at uh, water sanitation. I, I don't know where she got that from. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I hope that uh, stops at some point of time. <laughs> but um, so... Um, uh, so, so basically, um, with that said, this is basically just telling you, you know, um, the challenges uh, computer scientists in Egypt face with regards to the available opportunities there. And I just want to share with you that 33% um, of the population, that's about 26 million uh, of Egyptians, they're under the age of 14. And they have a lot of energy, they have a lot of will, they have a lot of revolution spirit. Uh, you just put an objective in their minds and they're going to get it. And I see that I have a lot of opportunity to actually influence uh, these minds. And I have so many ideas uh, based on the experience that I'm getting at Tech Woman. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, I will hope that I can make a difference one day in, in these lives. And by the way, 50% of the 26 million is, uh, are women. <laughs> and... <laughs> Just uh, one final uh, story that I wanted to share with you. Uh, during the revolution, um, I, like I went to Tahrir Square several times, and it was peaceful and it was uh, nonviolent at times. So I decided to take my daughter with me, and uh, we went there. And I was explaining to her how it's important to express your opinion and to say, you know, you speak out your mind, and you basically, you know, go for what you believe is what you uh, want to accomplish. And she was taking everything and she's silent. And then we went home and a couple of days later, she has a flyer saying, I want more allowance. So <laughs> that's not the point, by the way. But, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's uh, what it is. Okay. One word, fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> really, really a remarkable uh, set of women we have up here. So um, we're going to move into the, the Q&A phase, and, and uh, we have some prepared questions. Again, though, if there are questions from the audience, we'd encourage those, and, and also follow-on questions. Um, we do have only about half an hour or so left, so... Um, uh, we'll try to move through these, but um, I'm of the belief that uh, wherever the conversation meanders with, with this uh, uh, group of panelists, we're going to be um, uh, in good shape. So let me start in with the first question, and, and, and I'll read the question, and then um, for each of these questions, we'll have uh, two or in some cases three of the panelists um, who've offered to respond. So, panelists, are you ready? <laughs> okay, the first question. Uh, was there a particular person in your life, family, friend, teacher, that encouraged you, supported you to enter into the technical field? Please tell us about that person and how he or she changed your path. And Rhea and Reem are going to address this question. 
have a short answer. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I have a short answer, and uh, although there was not one person who would tell me go for this or go for that, but when I that when I had that slip into Zihi, the twelfth year, and I didn't get what I wanted <clears throat> in college, um, and I told one of my high school teachers that I'm going to study computer science, and she knew that it's not what I want. She told me one thing. She said, uh, "You will excel in whatever you do." And I'm so glad that she said that because it stayed with me, and uh, I I try to live up live up to that because although you don't always get to do what you love, you you can learn to love what what you do, and uh, it stayed with me. Um, okay, my my story. I mean, I think many people interfered in my choice of what to continue, <laughs> but not my parents. They were like people all around, all around me. Um, Okay, one of my uncles, he lives in Angola, and he, that's, I mean, we don't meet, really meet. I met him once in my life. So um, he actually called uh, once, and uh, while I was deciding, because I was really confused about uh, majoring between mass communication and computer science and a little bit of philosophy, but I was ashamed to say that because <laughs> it's really hard to get a job. With. <laughs> so, um, uh he just, he, I mean, he just called and he, I was telling him, like, I am looking between or maybe trying to decide between mass communication and computer science. And he just said, like, you know, mass communication or the information that you get, in his opinion, it will, as a speaker, because I like to speak and share my, what I say. So he said, uh, you can get it later, but you, to be, to guarantee a career, you need, like, to have something that, um, uh, that brings you some good money. So, <laughs> so I mean, once he said that, um, it was like this thing that made me decide on majoring in computer science, and uh, I thank him for that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I want to share in my uh, my story. So, at the end of the college, the uh, French professor told me, "Say that what you want to do with your life." I said, "Oh my God, this uh, you know, for a little girl." asking this question, so it's a big, a small, I don't know. So I don't know. He said, why are you not, uh, I mean, think about the electronics? So, oh, what, what does it mean? So imagine French professor talking about electronics. He said, you know, Saida, you know Japan? Okay, so there is many exciting things uh, happening in Japan, and there is many exciting story about Japan, and he started to tell, I mean, to tell me about um, his friend that is living there and saying how amazing life. I said, okay, and when I went to my, uh, I mean, uh, my home, I said to my mom, mom, I wanted to be like a Japanese people. <laughs> And, you know, uh, I just asked my, uh, I mean, French uh, professor just to explain this in my place and say how, how it is, I mean, amazing to, to I mean, uh, to follow some uh, unique, I mean, unique option like electronics. And, yes, I did it. That's what. Fantastic. Thank you. So next question. Um, even here in the U.S., technical careers are still uh, fairly, or some would say very male dominated. What advice would you give to young women here and in your country uh, who are interested in pursuing a technical career? And uh, we'll ask Gada and Saida to respond to this question. Okay, so, um, so I will basically say that um, anyone should actually act out of um, uh, you know, follow their passion, not out of fear. Uh, no one can, can choose something based on the fact that, oh, they're scared, it's male-dominated. Uh, there is always a first, a first step, and now there are a lot of women out there that are eager to help anyone who wants to go in the, into the technical field. And I, for myself, um, I mean, based on the tech woman experience, I would love to be approached by anyone and help anyone to help them decide if this is something they are passionate about or not. So basically, act based on passion, not based on fear, be persistent, be perseverant, and uh, seek out help from all those who can help you. And in in, in uh, my point of view, in a world dominated by men, I think women need to be highly educated. Being highly highly educated opens doors. This is the first I mean condition. And the second thing, 
uh, women need to establish some uh, networking. It's very important to women to have some strong networking. And the question why, it's simple. You know, by having a network, we are so close to the, I mean, the decision maker and making. So it's so important thing. There is something else. We are working in, uh, can say, a world of men. So as women, we need to establish, uh, we need to create the bridge with, with those men. And uh, for this, we need to enhance our cultural knowledge. So we need to know what's happening around us in terms of economic, cultural, political, every, I mean, uh, all this thing, I mean, very interesting. For instance, when I'm, when, I, when I'm talking with my boss, okay, there is some technical aspect, and what else? I have to, I mean, uh, to be so, uh, uh, enhance my uh, cultural political awareness to establish uh, this kind of communication with them. And I think this is very important. Is that it? Uh, if I can ask a, a follow-on question. Um, <laughs> I'm just curious, you, you've been in the technical field in region since 2000. Uh, how have you? What are the networks that you're connecting into now, and and how have you seen those evolve? And what what sorts of tools are you using to network with professional women? Are there are there physical face to face groups? Are there online uh, fora? Uh, what 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 does networking in 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 the Middle East for you look like? Uh, okay, I will talk about Morocco. So uh, uh, I will just um, describe the context uh, of Morocco. So in Morocco. We have uh, four, I mean, we have very low rate of uh, literacy. So imagine that in Morocco, we have 48% illiterate population. And for the women, uh, it's around 60%. And only for the middle, I mean, management, there is less than 3% women at the middle management. So networking is not really seen as a good thing for women. So in my, I mean, in my case, the only uh, way to network is to be uh, activate. I mean, active member in some association. This is why I told about the Dev Network, uh, that the aim the equality between men uh, and women in the uh, professional uh, I mean environment, and this allow me to be in contact with. The, can say uh, some leaders and to be in some conference like this, and also there is. Uh, I mean, thanks to technology. We are, I mean, so linked. And I want to just to, I mean, tell you a story about my technical uh, mentor. She is here. Hi, Minekshi. <laughs> so uh, when, uh, when the Tech Women Organization sent me an email that uh, my host company is Impay Connect, I was so surprised. I know Minekshi since two years. <laughs> and we are linked, we are linked, and, you know, I follow what she is doing. So that's amazing. We are so far, on, we, you know, we are far uh, from each each other, but we are so close using the technological tools that we have. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, next question, more controversial. <laughs> Do you think you're treated differently in terms of workload, responsibilities, and other areas than, than male counterparts in your office? And how do you handle this? And uh, we're going to ask Reem and Saida to respond to this. Um, well, I think uh, uh, this might be true uh, in the Middle East because there is like some culture restrictions um, in my, I mean, I'm talking about like my case. I, I think that um, uh, being late at the office and being requested to be available at different times may not be feasible. Uh, you have some family, uh, I mean, uh, uh, What's it called? Cons uh, yeah, you have to be committed to your family. You have to um, uh, to be present, and you can't like just be there at any time. So that's when I feel like uh, w men are uh, more dominant, um, and it's kind of still the same that male are dominant usually at the uh, higher management uh, positions. Uh, that's probably for the availability and for the. Um, uh, for other uh, cases of, for example, my company, we do a lot of outsourcing. So uh, this is usually the case that uh, people would, uh, it would be really hard for them to travel abroad. So um, targeting like a, a male for the, the, this kind of positions is usually the case. Um, 
I think to change this, we need to uh, to uh, enforce the idea of uh, men like um, women like us that do actually travel and are pres are available for such. Uh, 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 opportunities like that. Um, I mean, some of the mentees who are uh, participating are uh, mothers like Rada, for example, who left their kids behind and uh, they they decided to pursue a, a better uh, career or, I mean, something that will enforce uh, something good for them in their career. Um, so um, basically, that's that's where the I feel like there is mere dominance more maybe. So in Morocco, like uh, all women, we have the ability to work hard and to spend them in the, um, I mean, the, the needed time to honor our commitment. The problem that instead of to market uh, our achievement, we say, okay, we are doing our job. So uh, women work, uh, I mean, is seen only as, I mean, uh, high productivity with uh, less, I mean, less uh, cost. So this is why I think that uh, uh, women need to spend more time uh, to uh, to make I mean a visual I mean to make visual their uh, professional uh, skills not only physical skills and uh, also to communicate about their achievement and all what is uh, I mean uh, did as 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 work so we need really we have uh, some empty area here and we need to communicate more and to say, okay, guys, we did a, a, a good job. And I think it's no, we have not to be intimated or uh, shame about telling, uh, uh, telling, I mean, tell story about our uh, success stories. Thank you. Um, so maybe I've been lucky, but I have not really had uh, the misfortune to actually uh, feel that there is any difference between f male and female in my country, in my company. Uh, maybe because its headquarters is in the States. Uh, actually, when you come in into our building and when we have uh, visiting managers from the States, they're like sort of surprised. Why are they a lot of women in the building? And they and most of the engineers are actually female. And uh, and when it comes to the fact that uh, we have male that basically stay up till 11 p.m. in the evening and how do you compete with that? Uh, it's very important to, for me as a female to set the line of life and work balance. I have a family and I have a daughter and I have commitments. But what I can do is when I actually spend the time in the office, it is very productive. It's very efficient. I achieve, I accomplish, and the eight hours or the nine hours that I spent are um, uh, the best I can do every day. So from that perspective, I never felt that um, uh, the allocation of work is different, uh, that the expectation is different or that the workload that is expected is different in any way. Can I add one, one more thing? <laughs> I just, uh, as you were talking, uh, I don't have the problem also, just for, for those who don't um, have a background about, about our region. I also work for an international company, so like Rada, I don't have that problem, but actually we have some benefit. The, 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 the male bosses are starting to recognize that we women are better in nagging, which is also known as follow-up. <laughs> so we get the job done. <laughs> great. And that, that certainly are, we, we have uh, three Egyptian engineers on our team and two of those engineers are women. And they are certainly the ones who are leading, yes. So apologies to Ahmed. Um, so, our next question goes to the much discussed topic of social media. And uh, there's a great and ongoing debate about the role of social media in the revolutions. And, and uh, I think that no one in that debate is, is denying that it's played a very important role. Um, uh, and and uh, whether it's causative or not is is open for debate, but uh, certainly it's been incredibly relevant. Um, so the question that will be uh, Rea and Gada will address is is uh, regarding your your personal use of of social technology, and and the question is how do you and your friends use technology in your social life? And how has that changed in the past five years in terms of uh, cultivating a sense of freedom and independence on a personal level 
and uh, in in other ways that it's impacted your 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 life, your social life. Hello. Uh, at first, uh, I was introduced to Facebook as a social uh, first blogs. Uh, I'm a, I used to keep a diary pretty often uh, in college years, and I thought I'm going to love blogging. And it kind of uh, made me not only kill my blogging, but kill my diary too, because I thought, like, if I'm going to write, I can already write electronically and, and publish it to my friends. And, and, and when I didn't get time to do that, then I also didn't do my old writing. So it kind of was negative at first. Then I was introduced to Facebook. At first, I thought it was silly. And now I'm a very, very active user of Facebook. I have it integrated with my Twitter. And the most beneficial use of Facebook is community service. Like if you want to raise money for anything, especially in Ramadan, there's a lot of, issue, a lot of um, money raising and fundraising for, for projects for Ramadan. Uh, I remember one tweet, within 24 hours, we got like $1,500 to, to, to buy blankets. And uh, I find it very useful. Um, Facebook has been a key um, tool for that. Uh, Twitter too, because I have it on my mobile, uh, on my BlackBerry. So also the hardware is important with the social media. So there's also importance of, of the hardware that you carry with you. So these are very important tools and I find it most useful um, in community service. Uh, other than that, I find it very useful to get, stay connected with family and friends uh, abroad and that also always kind of uh, at the end falls into how can I use that connection to help uh, other people networking and uh, it's always useful at the end. And I personally used, to, I'm an introvert person. That means that I really don't reach out to people that often. And Facebook is the perfect place to just kind of, I send the message out there. I get a lot of replies and um, it, it's very generous. So I've never really expressed any political views or debated in my entire life. Okay, I was like a professional, technical person, family person, and I did not talk about politics whatsoever. And uh, recently in Egypt, uh, the scenario was a call for a pro protest on Facebook, coordinate via Twitter, and show the world via YouTube. So it, it was basically getting the social media in order to achieve a, spe a specific objective. Not only that, um, I got connected to friends um, whom like I've never I've 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 ne I've not met for like years. I would never have hoped to meet them even accidentally in the street. I know we all say it's a small world, but maybe in some cases it's not that small. So um, I got connected to my schoolmates. I got connected to my colleagues at Nortel Networks when I went back to Egypt. So from that perspective, it it's amazing. And as Raya said, uh, you know the campaigns we had after uh, uh, the success of the revolution. Uh, let's go down and clean the streets. Uh, let's go down and help uh, the day-to-day -day workers who are based on daily incomes. Let's do that. Let's do that. And you basically just um, lobby people and you do a specific action. But with that said, I really believe that these social media tools are addictive. Uh, being um, a, a, a professional person, sometimes I just can't get you know, and just leave the computer. I'm like, I'm just going to respond to that debate and then I'm going to write leave. And then someone responds and says something. OK, I'm just going to respond to that comment and then I'm going to leave. And uh, recently my daughter is like, mommy, you're like always on Facebook. I mean, what are you, I mean, you're always talking. What are you talking about? And uh, I, 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 I don't like that aspect of it. I don't like the fact that it's taking time away from my family and I'm like sort of uh, um, yeah, tuning it down, the usage, and allocating specific time to um, work on the social media tools. I would just add something. Um, I want to just share some numbers, I mean, uh, regarding Morocco. So Morocco, we have uh, 3 million Facebook account there, so with the 10% as a penetration rate, so it's a very high. So we are ranked uh, the, the second I mean, uh, population that using Facebook after Egypt. 
<laughs> and which is the amazing thing, I mean, uh, is the, for me, and the positive side is the access of, to the information. So access to information means the right to, to make uh, some choice and to choose something. And the amazing thing also in Facebook, uh, we have two ministers and one of the industry and another one of, um, of tourism. They have, I mean, they have uh, their, uh, their Facebook uh, picture uh, page and we are allowed to, I mean, to ask directly the question and you, you, I mean, you have to imagine how many questions we're asking direct to them. So saying, okay, we don't need the government, just uh, put, uh, I mean, some minister then and then we ask and they get. So what I want to, to say that uh, Facebook, okay, so this is just an example, uh, all the uh, social media, Really, it's a way to empower citizens and to give them uh, the choice and the access to uh, to ask directly the information and to get the direct and in real time feedback. That's all. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add something because I remembered when Saida said is that uh, um, actually right now the Egyptian army, they have a page on Facebook. So if you have any questions, you can post there. Uh, the prime minister has a, face on, a, a page on Facebook. So if you have comments, I mean, I don't know if they read them because they're like, you know, thousands every day. But uh, it, it, yeah, so that's that's one side of influence. They know where the opinion is. They know where the uh, the pressure comes from. So they decided to participate. Yeah, I, I think in, in the discussion of social media's role in the in the uh, revolutions, I mean, we're with uh, team members throughout the region working for Medan and sourcing media and our, and our involvement with this the speak to tweet project which was thank you google for that that was that was an amazing project and at one point we had a couple hundred translators working on uh translating voice messages but the i i think that it hosni mubarak deserves some sort of uh, honorary degree in in digital sociology for this fact that he shut down the internet and, and thereby provided an incredible control experiment on the, the power of personal revolution. And when, this, when the internet went off in Egypt, the revolution grew. And so I, I think that this, this deserves uh, uh, noting and-, and, and I think this title goes together. <laughs> okay. Yes, maybe it's a shared, a shared honorarium, uh, but um, so staying on this topic, which is which is uh, understandably popular. Um, another follow-on question, which I th I think that we we touched on some of this, but the the role of social media in creating a sense of uh, connection to the to the larger world, and and can you speak? specifically to how your use of social media has 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 broadened your your sense of connection with the world and and uh, I think everyone wanted to talk on this one so uh, uh, please um, okay uh, social media I mean they, t they already tackled this the girls where they were talking about the social media in the previous question. Um, I mean, I'm in contact now with a lot of people that I I knew in at different times while I was going all over like um, places. And in my case, um, as a Palestinian refugee, I I am away from my family almost all the time, especially like cousins and far members of the family. So um, I think uh, social media, be it uh, maybe um, Facebook or other like uh, uh, related uh, things like Twitter and all that facilitates a lot of communication. So um, I think it makes it makes really the world smaller. Uh, I mean, all the people that we knew here will actually stay in touch with them over uh, not only um, maybe Facebook and this kind of uh, social media. And also, I would also try to point out uh, the, the great uh, uh, benefit from LinkedIn. It's, uh, it's not only Facebook uh, separating 
probably like the connections that you have between uh, professional and uh, family f and friends, it's really important. And we actually tackled this in one of the um, uh, presentations that we had in at the Tech Woman at the beginning of this program. Uh, that we, you have all, always to take care about the uh, pre your presence online and uh, and to know when and what to share and who, with whom exactly. Okay, being in the mobile field, you know, to talk about the mobile as a way to connect with others. So yesterday with Minikshi, we have, you know, a long discussion about Iqbal uh, Kadir, uh, right, Minikshi? And she uh, she sent me a TED. So it's amazing what what uh, he tried to explain. So uh, be connected with Ali said, uh, connectivity uh, is productivity. That's mean we are connected. So we, we spend, I mean, uh, less time. Uh, to access to the information. So, for instance, I can give example. When a daily worker, uh, you know, he is reachable anytime, I mean, uh, anywhere. So, that means he could uh, increase uh, his productivity and, by the way, his income and, by the way, his uh, style of life. So, I think be uh, connected between citizens via many uh, ways like uh, social media, like mobile, it's really, uh, I mean, it's, it has a, a huge impact on, as, 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 as I said before, to empower the citizen and give them, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, one place where everybody could explain themselves and saying, "I'm okay. I like it. I don't like it." Then is another, "I don't like it in Facebook." So by the way, <laughs> no, <laughs> but at least I like it bad, or maybe just uh, to to put a comment. And I think it's very, very, very important in this case. But in other side, sometimes we are over connected too. So we are in Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. So I mean uh, anywhere. So over uh, over connected may make us as a slave to this. I mean uh, uh, media social. This is why we need to be more. I mean smart than this and say, okay, I have to ask question why I need the social media, for which purpose, for, I mean, professional, personal, keep contact, make revolution, I don't know, you know, we have to have, uh, we have to put some uh, purpose and something else, I think, now every one of us has, uh, how to say, how to say it, uh, a digital identity. So less ID, a physical identity, and also digital identity. How we need to be careful about this, and how we can express, I mean, ourselves through uh, this uh, this way. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, as I understand, um, we need to be cleared from the room at 8:30. So. Um, I think that we should that we should have one more question, and contra my uh, objective at the outset, I think the I, th I think the um, relative uh, quiet in the audience has been the fact that the presenters have been so fabulous, <laughs> and and uh, so I take it as an indicator of that. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but I. I wanted to offer that 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 we would take one last question, and and uh, um, I, I if, if there is someone in the audience who would like to, there's the first hand. So this is the final question, and 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 please, there is a mic a stand over here. So if if you don't mind, and then we'll ask each one of the panelists to address the question, and and then we we will wrap up uh, and close. Okay. Uh, my name is Doha Wais. Uh, I'm from Jordan. I'm part of the I IVLP delegation from Jordan. And I happen to be an IT consultant as well. And uh, as much as I liked your answers about being in a male-dominated uh, field, I just don't believe you so much. <laughs> I've been working in the IT field in Jordan since 1993, and it hasn't been easy. It's not all rosy. Maybe you've locked out in some companies, but it's not that easy. I would just like to hear from you just one example of if you've been through a situation or a spot where you would have, you thought deep in the back of your mind that had I been a male, I could have tackled this differently or I could have advanced or I could have been promoted or 
paid more. Can you just share some of these I, experiences um, with us? Yeah, I happen to be from the same country, and I know Doha and um, some of the community service that I was I mentioned um, is in cooperation with Tech Jordan, uh, which is a non-profit organization that that kind of uh, creates a platform for techie people from Jordan. Um, and uh, in order to answer this is, I think, because you're in a more senior position than, than for example, for me than I am. So I think when I reach um, the level, um, the professional level that you have reached, I will face trouble. I, I'm ready for that. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> and I hope you can help me and everyone here. <laughs> I, I, I need just to make a clarification. I didn't say I didn't believe you that I don't believe you. It's just yeah, yeah. It's it, it really is not yeah, easy. I mean, I'm, 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 the, I'm, the I'll levels. be really excited if the newer generation has it easier than we've had. Uh, so if so. if if I have if I have heard the um, I've seen a few tech talks about about women empowerment from the uh, uh, CPO of Facebook and so the numbers I think say that for example we have a lot of graduates the graduates are almost equal maybe even more in uh, female than, than male in Jordan, but uh, but on the executive level that's where the trouble um, is. So that's why I'm saying, like, until now, I haven't faced that problem. And I am, I think I will face it very soon if, if, if I, I continue this. <laughs> uh, I, I think, I mean, being a woman for me is not, uh, I mean, it should, for me, it's uh, a competitive advantage. But, I mean, uh, there is some conditions. Now, as I, as I said before, we need to be highly, I mean, highly educated. I cannot compete, uh, I mean, uh, a man and say, okay, I'm a woman, but I have him to be at the same level. Why not more than, than him? We are not in, uh, we are not, I mean, we are not in competition with the man, but we need just to, I mean, to address uh, our conditions. What I'm saying, in Morocco, we have 58% women, so we are more than men, but unfortunately, there is only 2% of women that are highly educated as engineers, as, you know, as doctors and all. So for us, there is a lot of work to do, and we are not to say, okay, men, women, we are just to work and to, to have some plan, I mean, government one at, uh, in our side too, so that's all. And for, for my experience, this is my first time that I'm with uh, such a huge number of, of women. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, this is, uh, it's making me some sense. Thank you. Um, so uh, maybe I would at some point say that I, be it uh, not being a Palestinian refugee would have made my life much easier. Because as like a Palestinian refugee, I'm treated like as a foreigner in Egypt. That's where I live, although I am I have an Egyptian mother. So um, my case is a little bit different. I already tackled that there is, I can see like in the higher level uh, management in my company, it's all men. Because uh, basically they believe, you know, uh, at my company that he could be available at any time. He could travel. He could represent the company better than a female. Um, it's not as complicated. But um, I'm still like at the probably like the junior years of uh, of my experience. So um, I think I'll be benefiting from you, not, <laughs> not the opposite. So um, as I said, maybe I've been lucky because I worked at Nortel Networks Canada and then in Mentor Graphics Egypt. But um, um, I, I, I honestly have not uh, been in a position or a situation where I said, had I been a man, it would have been different. Uh, but I, I can relate to what you're saying because I, I believe that I have an amazing manager at Mentor Graphics Egypt um, who believes that competency is what you do, not your gender or how old you are or any of these things. So for me, all I had to do is basically, you know, excel in something, have an edge, uh, um, you know, um, be the expert, for example, in a specific area or know how, and uh, that that put me in a position where I can't really be compared to a male and say we'll send him instead. So even when it was like a travel uh, opportunity or something like that, it was basically the person who knows best 
and who he uh, and who would travel. Uh, sometimes I delegated the travel to uh, to uh, male peers, uh, just because I felt like I traveled a lot and I wanted them to take the opportunity. So again, maybe I'm lucky, and I know uh, from colleagues that uh, there are some friends in local firms in Egypt that are not international that are suffering big time because of the female male mentality. But I think that us being here in this program. Uh, um, and one of the main uh, objectives I, I personally wanted to achieve is to be able to cross the border of reaching out to society and helping others. Um, I was working a lot on my career, uh, on uh, my family, and I wanted to go beyond that. So um, so I, I, I hope that I can make a difference in these local firms in changing the mentalities in reaching out uh, to the young population in Egypt to uh, make every female understand that it's what she knows, not what uh, her gender is. Um, I, I can't imagine uh, ending on a, on a uh, more positive note than that. And, and I'd, I'd like to um, thank the four panelists. I'd also like to thank the 37 all 37 participants in the, in the project for being the leaders who are going to bring who are going to bring the role of women in technology and engineering fields in the Middle East forward. So, um, thanks to IIE for the event this evening. Uh, thanks to the United States State Department uh, for supporting this project. Uh, and and uh, encourage everyone to to mingle and exchange business cards and uh, hire brilliant young engineers if you uh, are are a corporate member of the audience and and um, uh, and and uh, thanks again to to Trish and Heather for putting the event together. Can, can I say something? Yes. <laughs> you promised uh, a, a short summary of uh, about you, like so you didn't do that. <laughs> You need to tell us a bit about yourself. We, we, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, no. Are you, are you, you're serious? Oh, dear. Okay. Um, I am on the spot here. As the moderator, you're supposed to always be prepared for uh, cross-questioning. I think that it's appropriate to just mention that that um, I, Medan is an NGO. We are based in San Francisco. I work with a team of uh, eight full-time uh, people and about 30 consultants around the region, and they're the most wonderful people in the world. So uh, I feel very blessed to, to be a part of this organization. Our mission is to simply increase the amount of knowledge knowledge exchange happening between Arabic and English. We do this, uh, we had a three-year research partnership with IBM Corporation, two of their research labs. We have a machine translation engine and we allow human beings to correct the output and we contribute all the data to an open source database that fuels research and promotes access to knowledge. So it's it's a non-ideological project aimed at helping globalization uh, kind of walk the talk of, you know, creating more understanding, better connections, and and ultimately more knowledge. Um, I also want to point out that in the audience somewhere tonight is is my best friend from second grade, and uh, and uh, this is Kent Bears here. So. And and I don't just Kent is an environmental scientist, and I mentioned Kent because somebody asked me, and here I'm going on, but uh, somebody asked me how I came to be doing this, and and uh, Kent just happens to be visiting today, and just happened to be there when I was explaining this, and and uh, the project started uh, in April of 2003 when I sent an email to Kent. Uh, bemoaning the kind of state of the post 9-11 world and he wrote back and said I want to publish this as a full page ad in the New York Times 
and that one email has sparked a project that has created a lot of wonderful things for a lot of people. So one email can change the world, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. Okay.